not true brilliant student the brilliance in your stu uh, studying which means your certificate which shows 98% marks only will open a door it will not take you through rest of life to go through rest of life you need something much much more and that is not your knowledge knowledge is the beginning the certificate is the beginning but navigating through life is a different ball game what does it mean to navigate through life what it means is that you can say what you want to say you can stand up for what you believe in it means you are not judging people it means you are not rejecting people it means you are welcoming them into your space and at the same time maintaining your boundary that no one kind of misuses you you have the strength to say no when you want to say no <coughs> and you have the strength to support others when they need to be supported these are the fundamentals of life and in that it doesn't matter how much of history geography science mathematics and everything else that you know people call that character building but this character building is not really about uh being honest being ethical being moral no i am not talking about that character those characters are needed in order just to keep the society to be in a peaceful state that no one will harm others i am not talking about that character and that character also is needed we don't need to harm others but i am talking about another character a character which has strength a character which has uh clarity a character where you can say what you want to say and also a character where you can give others space to say this is a very different kind of character this is not about being right and wrong good and bad this character will allow you to navigate through life much peacefully much coherently and to be in the flow of life and this thing does not require knowledge this thing does not require you to study books this thing requires only one thing that you are feeling good in who you are you are feeling good in the way you look <clears throat> you are feeling good in the way you speak you are feeling good in the way you come across you are feeling good with your height and weight you are feeling good in your color and texture you are feeling good in the way in the vocabulary that you have you are feeling good to the extent that you can perform but what happens is you look left and right and then you start judging yourself I wish I had that person's skills I wish I had that person's height I wish I had that person's figure I wish I had that person's skin I wish I had that person's ability to speak I remember almost I'm talking about ah <coughs> uh, maybe about uh, say 15 to 20 years back 15 to 20 years
years back, uh, I was in business, okay? So, in my business, I really didn't need to interact with huge number of people. That was not the nature of my business. I was a man who dealt with machines, made things, and things got sold, so there wasn't much of an interaction with people. And then started a new phase of my life. In this new phase of my life, I became a, I became a, what did I become? I became a, let's say, instructor. Not like teaching students, but I was teaching certain healing modalities to people. Now teaching to healing modalities to people meant I had to interact with them. But I was an introvert, very shy, never wanting to meet people, never wanting to be with a group of people, scared. The moment I am in front of people, my heart would beat dhak 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 dhak. My knees would shiver. I would always want this kind of podium to really hold tight and lean onto it. I wanted to hide behind the podium so that people cannot see my legs shaking. This was not a life I wanted, but life pushed me into this life. I wanted to run away, but I had no other profession but the one I was engaged in. And then, you know, what was my coping mechanism? I would read all kind of books and all kind of YouTubes I would see of people who are great speakers, who are great orators, who would go on the stage and mesmerize people with their strength of their voice, with the strength of their vocabulary, with the strength of their humor, with the strength of their ability to deliver, and everything that I liked. I would memorize certain jokes to make people laugh, but unfortunately I couldn't connect the jokes to what I was saying. And even if I forced myself to deliver those jokes, no one would laugh. You would call that PJ, poor joke. Imagine my condition. I wasn't able to become a good speaker. And I thought I was doomed for life. I thought I, I tried to memorize my speech. But the moment I would come in front of the people, I would forget everything. I would become dumb. So the way I would survive was I would make PowerPoint slides. I would turn my back on the audience and I would keep reading those slides. That was who I was around 15 to 20 years back. How did the transformation start? How did I become something different? <coughs> the first thing I told myself that I cannot become who they are. I can only become who I am. So stop trying to become someone different than what I am. And I stopped strategizing. I stopped exhib exhibiting my confidence even though from inside I had zero confidence. I was open to tell people that I am scared. I was open to tell people, maybe I don't know enough. Maybe you know more than me. But I know a little bit of what I am going to say. And let me just say that. If you find that valuable, take it. If you don't find that valuable, 
I'm sorry I wasted your time. And slowly I became authentic. I was inauthentic before. Whenever you try to become something that you are not, you are inauthentic. Because life never wanted you to become someone else. Life did not want you to become a, take on a role model and become the copycat of that role model. Life did not want you to be anything different but for what you are. I realized life had created me to be unique within this skin that I am. And that uniqueness may not be appreciated by the world. But just because I want the appreciation of the world doesn't mean that I will try to become something different from what I am. And so started my journey to become authentic. What is authentic? I stopped being, trying to become that which I was not. And slowly a time came when I could stand in front of people and say, I don't know what to say. But let's see what I can say. That's how I came to a place of, I can go to any meeting, I can go to any I can have any conversation without having any idea what I am going to talk. Because now it is not really about scoring 90% marks in life. Now this is about you have to live. When it is about passing exams, I understand. You have to really memorize and you have to really put it on the paper. But after you have passed your school and your college, now there is no exam paper. And if there is an exam paper, that paper is delivered to you every moment. And every moment you are either passing or failing. <coughs> and who is the judge to decide whether you have passed or failed? You yourself. In the school, in the college, there is a teacher, there is a professor. But in life, you are the judge. Not even your boss, not even your clients, not even the people whom you serve. You will say, I am successful and you will say, I am a failure. You will say, I am good enough and you will say, I am not good enough. These are all your judgments. You will say, I am lousy. Or you will say, I did well. You will put all your levels of pass and fail on your head. And if you are not happy with who you are, you will start beating yourself up. Why you will beat yourself up? Because when you were growing up, from the age of 0 to 7, Every time you made a mistake, you were punished. Either you were punished physically or you were punished emotionally, which means they shouted at you. Or you were punished psychologically, where they said you are not good. But punishment happened. And what was your life about? Your life was only about one thing. Do my parents love me? What can I do to make my parents love me? As a child, that was your only criteria. I want my parents to love me. What can I do? How can I please them? And when you failed, when you gave up, you went to the other extreme. You became a rebel. You don't love me, I am not also going to love you. That's who a rebel is. You decided not no more to listen to your parents. You decided no more to follow to your, your parents. You decided no more to 
you decided to make their life difficult. This is just what the human journey is. Either you are pleasing people or you are making their life difficult. Basically, what is it you are seeking in life? You are seeking love. You want love. You want people to respect you because love is always not easily available. So we have some substitutes of love. What is that love? That love is like people should respect me. People should acknowledge me. People should notice me. People should applaud me. People should say good things to me. These are the substitute of love. And now you are seeking all these things. To be noticed, to be acknowledged, to be appreciated, to be given a certificate, to be told that you are so great. And just for the sake of that one line, you spend years and years to excel. Excel in what you are doing. Now there are two kinds of people who excel. One kind is they are passionate. Their passion is so huge that they cannot stop but pursuing what they are pursuing. And there is a second kind. And this second kind is they want something from the world, some kind of recognition. And the highest recognition in our world is getting the Nobel Prize or Peace Prize or some prize where people say, wow, wonderful. So you, you decide you want to excel either from your passion or you want to excel because you want people to say you are great. But when will you say you are great? Now you say that I cannot say I am great until and unless I have done something very big, something very beautiful, something very excellent, something which is like creates a kind of wow feeling in me. But unfortunately, for most of us, that day will not come. Because most of us are average people. Most of us are mediocre. Most of us are just performing in order to have our bread and butter. The system will push you to become above average. Then let me tell you, there will be different speakers who will come to you. There will be, there will be different speakers who will be speaking to you. Those who have excelled in life, they will tell you, you must excel. Those who have become overcome all kind of obstacles, they will say, never give up. Those who have come from the rags to riches, they will say, you can do. But this speaker who stands in front of you is a very mediocre person. I have nothing in my life that is worth showing to people. I have no trophy in my life. Everything in every area of my life, I have nothing been but a failure. I have not been a good father. I have not been a good husband. I have not been a good brother. I have not been a good son. All the failures of life is mine. I was, as a student, my only goal was just to get passing marks. And in those days, passing marks was 
for to die in for 40 so that I am somewhere between 33 and 40 but I would still fail in one subject and in those days they had what they call as something I think a TKT which means like they would give us grace marks just to push you one class above they didn't want us to hang out in the earlier class that's the person standing in front of you but I tell you this person has something not excellence not something great but I am a demonstration of how someone who is simple, who is ordinary, who is mediocre, can still be effective in life. So I stand in front of you for those students who are not that great. I stand in front of you for those students who are struggling with their studies. I stand in front of you for those students who are not able to excel in the sports. I stand in front of you for those students who think that you will not be really all that successful. Remember me then, I wasn't. And I didn't become, I didn't even try to become one. I knew life was something else. And life was really about enjoying life. I enjoyed my life thoroughly. So that when I die, I will know that I have lived. I have not lived for my family. I have not lived for others. I have only lived for myself. You can say I am a very selfish person. But there are other selfish persons who try to exploit others for their own benefit, which I didn't do. There are selfish persons who try to snatch things from others, which I didn't do. There are selfish persons who cause harm to others, which I didn't do. I was so happy with the little that I had. And I wanted nothing more from life. And because I wanted nothing more from life, life started delivering a clarity about life. A clarity that made me see everything so clearly. I'm not a man of knowledge. I don't have any PhD. I barely completed my graduation. Barely. I have not read all that great books which the scholars read, which the philosophers read, which the thinkers read. I don't need to think, I know. I know because I want nothing from anyone. I want nothing from life. I have no ambitions. I have no desires. I have no wanting. And whenever a wanting would show up, I would really let them go. And as I started settling down in enjoying what I have, because most humans don't enjoy what they have, I started blossoming from inside. I started flowering from inside. My wounds started healing. My trauma started leaving. My negativity, they would still show up, but they wouldn't remain for long. I still become angry. I still become sad. I still sometimes have jealousy. But I can also delete them immediately. Because I have the technique to delete them. 
I taught people those techniques. You don't really need to carry on with your stress, with your negativity, with your fear, with your frustrations, with your anxiety, with your confusion. And so, I am not talking to you about God because what will you do with God? But I am talking to, to you about something that God gave. And I have put that into a book because God said put it into a book. You do not know God. You only heard the word. And let me tell you, hardly anyone in this world knows God. Because in order to know God, you really have to talk with God the way I am talking with you. Who can talk with God whenever they want to talk? And first of all, to know God, you also have to understand what is not God. How will you understand what is not God? And let me also tell you, everything that you have been told that this is God and God and that is God is not God. Everything. Because God never was in this universe. Till now. There were others who said we are God. And that's okay. So what do I bring to you as a gift? And let me tell you one thing, listening to me is very soothing. And I know how the room has gone to sleep. And it's very beautiful to have that sleep. Because in that sleep, you are being healed. Mm. Do not resist the sleep that is coming to you. It is the grace of God that flows to you, some of you. And sleep is a very natural outcome. Going silence is a very natural outcome. Becoming peaceful is a very natural outcome. So let that be. Do not struggle with that. For those of you who are still awake, what is the gift that I have for you? I will leave a few books which will be in your library. And whenever you are angry, Whenever you are sad, whenever you are frustrated, whenever you are feeling there is no one to whom to talk to, whenever you feel no one listens to you, whenever you feel I am not able to concentrate in my studies, whenever you feel I don't have the focus, whenever you feel you are not able to remember, whenever you feel that you are overwhelmed, Whenever you feel that people are pushing you and you are not able to deal with that push, whether it comes from the students or from the teachers, whenever you feel any kind of negativity, go to that book, speak to that book and return that book. Next day again you feel that, take that book, speak to that book, return that book. No need to even read the book. The book is alive. The book will deliver. The book will heal. And do that for 30 days and see how you are shifting. How you are becoming peaceful. How you are becoming more clear. How you are becoming more receptive, how your inner aggression is coming down, how your inner negativity is coming down. It's a beautiful book, not in terms of the contents, forget about the contents, the book. Up till now you were told that you should read a book. I am telling you don't read it. I am only saying talk to the book. No author has ever told you that. Every author wants you to read what they have written. And I am telling you don't read what I have written. 
it will be too much for you. Not because it is very complicated language, but because no one has ever talked about them. So don't read. Unnecessarily you will go into is this right? Is this wrong? What I knew was that right? Was that wrong? Don't go into all those nonsense. Talk to the book and then return the book. Next day again, come whenever you have time. Take the book. Five minutes. Talk to the book. Return the book. And whenever you feel frustrated, whenever you feel you have no, no one to support you, talk to the book. Whenever you feel you are not able to deal with life, talk to the book. Whenever you feel you are feeling overwhelmed, talk to the book. Very simple. I am a very simple and practical person. But most people who are in the God business, they are very philosophical, very moral, very ethical and into right and wrong, good and bad. I mean, none of those things. I deliver results. I am not interested in trying to make you a better human. You will become, become a better human with God. I don't have to make you. I don't tell you how you should live. You will know how to live. I don't tell you what to do and not to do. You will know what to do and what not to do. I am not a preacher. Every person in the God business is a preacher. I don't preach. I don't preach because I love you. questions I will take.
for the others. Never allow any sort of <coughs> negativity in your mind. That yes. will kill you. Yes. But what happens in this particular world when you know when you try to make a resolution after reading that particular book that you have to be firm, you have to be good, you have to create happiness for yourself and for the others. But what happens when the external forces distract your tapasya and when then you cannot focus in that particular line and when you deviate from that action. So how to remain strong in that particular part? Always I try to take some sort of a resolution in my life that I have to be good, I have to, I should not allow any sort of negative or poor thoughts in my mind. But then because of the environment, because of the some external forces, I'm getting deviated. So how to remain firm okay. in that? Please, please so just to sum up the question that uh, he asked me, it's like, the book says, be positive, do not be negative. But the life delivers only negativity or events that bring up negativity. Then how can we remain positive? That is a, that is a question that kind of almost many people are having. Everyone wants to be positive. Who wants to be negative? And yet the whole uh, situation of life is we become negative. Now, the nature of the mind, you have to first understand the mind, irrespective of what is conscious, subconscious, unconscious, all those things are different. The nature of the mind is it always remembers the negative, it is always attracted to the negative, it always wants to dwell into the negative. Nature of the mind. Did you get it? Nature of the mind is it is attracted to the negative, it wants to remain negative and it wants to dwell into negative which means all thought, feelings and emotions that keep coming to the mind are negative, very rarely positive. Now in that, in such a situation, how can I become positive? Then the ans answer to that is, do not try to become positive, irrespective of what the book says. My knowledge of mind far is far superior to whatever that person called Joseph Murphy said. I am telling you, you cannot be positive. But you can bring your negativity down. How? Go and speak to the book. All the anger I am having against that person, all the negativity I am having against that person, all the judgments I am having against that person, I don't want to be near that person, I don't want to work with that person, I hate that person. I wish that person will get transferred. I wish I get a new job. I wish I pa uh, leave this place soon. Whatever your judgments are that brings up the negativity against a person, against a event, against the way the world is right now. Keep telling to the book. Keep telling to the book. Keep telling to the book you will notice something beautiful happening within one month. Your judgments will start coming down. Your negativity will start coming down. It is not that you will become positive. Positive is the other polarity. Unfortunately, a coin has two sides. You cannot delete one side of the coin and have the other side. Delete both. We don't want positivity. But if negativity shows up, I go and talk with the book. That is my way of deleting negativity. And you will notice when the negativity is starting to come down, whatever that remains is neither positive nor negative. What remains there is you are alive. Come into aliveness. 
not positivity. What is aliveness? Aliveness is the capacity to be with life in a non-judgmental non state. Without having any expectations, without having any wanting, and without wanting to fix life, without wanting to change life, without wanting to change people. That is aliveness. Aliveness is not laughter. Aliveness is not jumping. Aliveness is not excitement. Because these things are spikes. Spikes means you have seen those spikes happening in that flowchart. These are spikes and any spike that goes up will also come down. They don't remain. Aliveness remains. Aliveness means you are being present. You are being present to how that person is. And I am not saying that person is beautiful or ugly. I am saying how unique that person is. Appreciating the uniqueness of every person is aliveness. But a dead people either want to hold on to someone or want to push someone away. Because they have no life force to deal with the ups and downs of life. So that's my answer to your question. There was another gentleman in the house. Please, sir. Sir, is it not wrong to have a Isn't it not wrong to? Oh, you are asking me, is, isn't it wrong not to have an ambition? Yes, sir. That is what your question is? Okay. If you notice life, you will also notice life does not give you what you want. Except for those speakers who say life has given me what I want because I did X, Y, Z. Let me tell you one example. There was a person who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Have you heard of that person? Stephen Covoy. There was another person whose name I have forgotten, but he was a time management guru. The guy knew everything about management. And this guy knew everything about what it means, how a person can be successful. They both came together. They thought they will create a, a magnificent company. And in that company, they will create global transformation. And that company miserably failed. How can two successful people, two gurus, come together and fail so badly? They had ambitions. They wanted to create global transformation. But did life allow that? So always understand what life is allowing. Be very alert. It's okay to have ambitions. Ambitions means you are telling life, listen, I want to become this. I want to reach at that point. I want to have that. But also listen to what life wants. Because life is the one that is going to deliver to you. You cannot go and make it happen. But there are others who will say you can make it happen. Yes. But for that, you have to destroy yourself and your life. And your aliveness. Because the very crux of being human is not to become supernatural. The very crux of being human is really to come alive. And what it means to be alive? It means to live within your five senses. How can you live within your five senses when you are living in the moment? <coughs> what are you doing when you want to, when you become ambitious? You are living in the future. And what happens to the victims? They live in the past. So neither past nor future brings the aliveness in the human to show up. This human has no clarity. Only a human living in the moment has clarity. And this human knows 
what to respond, how much to respond, when to step back. So there is nothing wrong with ambitions, I am not against ambitions, but allow your ambitions to create the journey, the direction of your life, but also at the same time be alert to notice, is life supporting me in that direction or not? Otherwise, you will end up fighting with life and there have been many people who have been very successful but at the same time miserable and committing suicide. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Deepam. I teach here. Yes. I have a curious question to ask. Yes. Yes. In, uh, in a situation where he is truly with himself or herself, and then ask and wait for the answers to come. Yes. And gradually, I have it tested that I am not asking myself the same question. Yes. So I am asking myself different questions every day. Yes. But isn't it worthwhile then to just spend a quality time with oneself every day? given a chance. It because, is what because the luxury of time is fading away. I also don't have the luxury of time. But I still make it a point that I spend a little time with myself to ask and clarify those questions, look for answers. But I'm realizing that's what I keep telling my students as well, that every day I'm not asking myself the same question. I'm asking myself different questions. And I also make it a point that if I get suitable answers, I feel Life yes. I speak to the students. If you have not heard of a story, or, and it's a very common story, but just let me give a very brief outline. And it's one of my favorite stories. There was once a wood cutting or tree cutting competition. Everyone was given an axe. They were saying, One hour you have. And everybody rushed out and started cutting the tree. But there was one guy. He did not rush out. He started sharpening the axe. And almost half the time, or maybe a little more, he kept on sharpening the axe. And then when others were like halfway through, now this person gets down into the game and he ends up to be the winner because he had a very sharp axe and because he had a very sharp axe he was becoming less tired in cutting the trees his muscles were not losing strength he was not running out of breath and the way his axe was moving was much faster much deeper than what the competitors acts were moving. So what is the lesson from this story? The lesson from this story is what right now your teacher pointed to, asking the question. And you have to ask the right question, but we do not know what that right question is. So you cannot wait for the right question to come even. Just make it a habit of sitting down and ask the question that really has been in your mind throughout the day. Be with the question. Do not rush into the answer because if you rush into the answer it will come from all that you know and you are trying to access what you do not know. And you will find if you continue with this practice, you will master the art of asking the right questions. And when you have the right questions, those answers will transform your life or contribute in a huge way to your life. Thank you so much. Yes.
man, please. You have to little shout. I am a little. Someone in between, listen to her, and then you tell me. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to go there. <laughs> my uh, my hearing is a little. She is asking me. Sorry. <laughs> she is asking. Just be here and correct me if I didn't get it. She is asking me that I am telling you to be in the moment. But what about our future? What about our academic life? What about our? Uh, that's exactly the question. Yes. Uh, I am asking you. Uh, is that the question? I. That's the bottom line of the question. Okay, so how does being in the moment and planning for the future come into synchronicity, into congruency? Because both seem to be contradictory. But let me put it this way. Thank you. <coughs> let me put it this way because there is a way to look into it. When you have lived the moment fully, you have really taken care of your future. When you have lived your moment, moment poorly, you have already sabotaged your future. Did you get it, students? If you have lived your moment fully, you have taken care of your future. If you have lived your moment poorly, you have sabotaged your future. What does this mean? Because this might seem a little philosophical. Practically, what does it mean? Practically, it means learn the art of listening. Because in the moment, as a student, your job is to listen. And learn the art of contemplating. Because what you have listened, if you do not come contemplate, then that goes away. It enters through one year, goes away through the another year. And then learn the art of digesting. Why digesting? Because everything that you listen, most of the time you don't listen. You are lost in your mobile, you are lost in your uh, neighbor, you are lost what's happening outside the window. Or you are thinking about what happened in the morning or what happened yesterday and what you will do tomorrow. So you are not listening. Even though you are looking at the teacher. Number one. Number two. Having listened, you feel listening is enough. But recreating it in the mind is important. Which means... What is it that the teacher really wanted to tell me? You are writing it down on a piece of paper, on a notebook. What you think the teacher told you? Having written down what, and I am not talking of taking notes. Notes is different. Notes is like you are taking, you are uh, uh, Google translating or Google transcribing. That is taking notes. I am talking about contemplation. In your understanding, what did you think the teacher said? Write it down. And then, having written that down, the next question is, what does it mean? What does it mean to me in terms of uh, my future application, my future goals, my future uh, whatever I want to become in my life. This is now digesting it. Unfortunately, you know, today we do not have that system in our schools. If, 
if the schools bring in a system that what you have learnt in class 7 and now you have gone to class 8, you have to teach two periods to class 7 students. You are forced to do that. You will go into the books because you cannot come in front of the students and really get booed by the students. That's the way to learn, which means to teach. But for you to teach, you have to digest. You have to confront the questions of the students. But unfortunately, we don't have that system. So that's the answer to your question that what about our future if we are so engrossed in the moment? You take care of the moment. Your future is taken care. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, our experience is quite a few times that people talk to me. People talk to me. People talk and people talk to you. And they say what they feel about the situation. What they feel, okay. And we understand that it, it's, it's, it's a particular state of mind that is being explored at the yes. point of time. And we also can see what will happen as a part of the transformation. The state of mind will change, will go through changes. Yes. And sometimes, some, and this is my personal problem, sometimes it gets very boring to... To listen to people? To, yeah, sometimes we know the jargon all the all the Yeah, time. because they are repeating themselves. And many times, many people repeat the same thing again. Exactly. So it becomes boring. Yes. How do you handle that? I mean, I have, I'm trying to find out my own ways, but, you know. You're talking about, people. you're talking about the students? Uh, no. I'm more talking about the elderly ones. Not about the teachers or parents or anything. It's, it's the whole world that is giving the same story all the time. People do not have much to talk in their vocabulary. Their complaints are very, if it is written on a page, it doesn't go to the second page. And they keep on repeating that like a loop. And now if they are a part of your family, you have to listen. But if they are not a part of your family, you can walk out. I do not know which target group is playing this game with you. It is not about innocence. It is just about how much energy and time you want to spare. So, but if it is your students, then I will answer in a different way. <laughs> because right now we have the students with us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Good morning. I'm Good morning. Sharman and I'm a teacher. Uh, sometimes I face problems like, uh, suppose like uh, you have given answer to many of my questions also in this class. Okay. So I'm very thankful to you. Uh, like, uh, so I have uh, read a book uh, by a famous author, Rashmi Vartan. She has written a book, Connect the Dots. So we think about the future and we keep connecting the dots to become something or the other. But once I start, uh, was listening to Steve Jobs' quote, he Man. said that uh, we cannot connect the dots looking forward, but we connect the dots looking backward. Like whatever has happened to us is because of some of previous decisions. So like previous is the important, future is the important, or what life is trying to us is important. So I am confused. Since you read that book, can you tell me in one line exactly what the author said about connecting the dot to the future? How do you connect yeah, the dot? Connecting the dot to the future means suppose I want to become something. Yeah. Suppose I want to start a business. Whatever. Okay. Huh. So we need to figure out what all we can do and we need to connect the dot. Like uh, okay. this much funding we will get, whatever anything is. Okay. This is what it means this to connect the dot, which means logistically. Logistically, you can say uh, and like financial. Financially yeah, finance is a part of logistics yeah, and in, uh, like uh, how do you think about that? Uh, how do you think? But your, your vision can be. Uh, but you are again about. thinking logistically. Ah, yes, you can say. So everything now is a part of logistics. Suppose a student is going to go 
But it's all about logistics, if you notice. Yeah. Selecting the right coaching class, right. getting the books, right. Right. which chapters to read, to study. what was asked before. So it's all a part of logistics. This is what is connecting the uh, dots. I'm talking about life. Life is not about connecting the dots. Life is about coming alive. There are two different things. There is no logistics in life. In life you are either dead or you are alive. Or half dead or half alive. So I am, my whole focus is about as you are living now, can you be a little more alive than you are? As far as connecting the dots is concerned, depending on your capacity to connect, you will connect. Some can connect it very beautifully, others struggle to connect because they do not have the mindset to figure out everything and some can beautifully figure out everything but no one can figure out how to become alive and when you are alive you will notice many things fall in place not because of what you do because of who you have become when a person is alive life wants to come and support that life <coughs> support that person. But when a person is dead, life also withdraws from that person. Everything for that person becomes a struggle. And then that person has to live with his willpower and with his strength and becomes tired very soon. So, my answer to that question is, it's good to connect the dots. But more priority is come alive in the moment. Let life start connecting the dots. Let life start opening the doors in which you can step in rather than trying to break the doors to enter. This is my perfect takeaway from your session today that being alive is very important. Fine, like connecting the dots for future is gone now. I have understood that. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> the point is, yeah. uh, generally we don't think about the positivities yeah. which have happened to our life. We are like uh, moreover involved in whatever negative has happened to us, uh, any tragedy, whatever it is. So how do we face that? Like, but did I, you be <coughs> connecting the did dots? I not tell you what is the core nature of the mind to dwell into the positive uh, negativity? to contemplate on the negativity and to always think negativity. That is the nature of the fundamental nature of the mind. Fundamental nature of the mind is not positive. So, what people try to do is they try to cultivate positivity. They try to practice positivity. They try to force themselves to become positive. They try to remain aware that I am remaining positive. That is actually becoming tight. You are not being natural. You are not being relaxed. Because when you are relaxed, you are negative. It comes automatically. That's where the book comes in. Go and talk with the book. All your negativity, all your negative thoughts, feelings, emotions, Every way you are judging yourself, every way you are judging others, every way you are, all the pain that you are having, all the sadness, all the grief, all the regret, all the shame, all the guilt, say everything to the book. Not much, just two, three minutes. Leave the book. Next time, next day again that shows up in your awareness, go and speak to the book for two, three minutes. Leave the book. Do it for 30 days. See the results. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Good morning. Also, not 
You see, morality was brought into the humans because basically our nature is animalistic. In order to put certain chains on us, ring, we have been told, you better don't do all these things. Left to our nature, animal nature, we will tend to do them. So morality has a place in society. Ethics has a place, place in society. But practicality means if your country drives the car on the left side, do not try to drive your car on the right side because you will create a mess. This is practicality. That being so, I said I am practical, I am not moralistic, I am not ethicalistic. Why? Because these two are already delivered. I don't have to again come and tell people about them. They are already there. But practicality people are not talking about. Because they give you a strategy on being practical. I am not giving you a strategy to be practical. I am saying come alive and you will know what is needed to do in that moment. You see, people who come as a speaker or a guest have already thought about what they want to give to the audience. And I have been talking now for last four days to all kind of people and have no idea what to talk. I just go and stand, I just look, I connect and I try to feel. And from that feeling, I start speaking. Can you live your life from your feelings rather than from your thinking? If you are alive, you will live your life from your feelings. If you are dead, you will live from your thinking. Unfortunately, your thoughts will not carry you much and wherever it carries you, it will only deliver all kind of uh, negativity. But feelings, wherever it carries you, it is very ordinary, but it will be beautiful. And you are not there really to be to waiting that you all will give me a great certificate. What I am more interested is in having fun with you. A person who is alive is always having fun. A teacher who is alive is having fun with the students. A student who is alive is having fun with the teacher. When no one really is putting any pressure on each other. But everyone is relaxing the other person. And as the students relax, as the teacher relaxes, something beautiful starts happening, which didn't happen before. Otherwise, teachers are more like what recorder, tape recorders. They come, put on their recorder, in 45 minutes over, switch off the recorder, go out. But where is the fun? Where is aliveness? Where is looking into the eyes and feeling the pain of that student? And where is the students who are looking into the teacher? Maybe the teacher didn't have a good day. Maybe something went wrong in his house. Maybe he is under some kind of pressure. And maybe he is so feeling frustrated. The student is also not alive to the teacher. So when we become alive, something beautiful shows up between us. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Stand up. So uh, you said that uh, knowledge and uh, certificates are like uh, there. Uh, they are the beginning, and they open a door. So I have this question that uh, when can we actually think that we have achieved something in life? Ah, uh, right. Right now you can feel that because you in which class you are in. I'm 
you are in ninth class that means you have achieved eight class passing in eight classes that itself shows that you have achieved and you have arrived to the ninth class so you don't need to already reach to a point to know that you have achieved but if you are enjoying the ninth class if you are exploring what is in the books of the ninth class if you are exploring what is the teacher that wants to teach in the ninth class you are being alive and from that aliveness you will keep on reaching you otherwise you have to keep on dragging and alive people just flows a dead person has to drag themselves it's like getting up in the morning i don't want to go out i don't want to go to the school but still i have to go so i am like half eyes closed dragging myself putting on the dress and running to catch the bus and but you are dragging there is no aliveness there is no freshness there is no energy so you are already arrived where you are and not in the next moment okay thank you yes yes so my question conjugates with one of the question asked by our my colleague yes uh, mr dcom so whenever i am alone and i am self reflecting so i have few questions in my mind and whenever i think of them i get answers and i believe i will not receive such answer i mean nobody will be able to give me such logical answers to those questions so now my question to you is are those answers coming from my subconscious mind or they are coming from as we say there is god inside us or they are actually the answers from my own experiences so whether should i trust those answers or i should ask those questions i should go and ask those questions from anybody else as i should not think that i am over i mean am i over confident that no the answer which i'm getting are right actually okay <clears throat> first first let me tell you that the answers come from many places it comes from the subconscious mind it also comes from the unconscious mind it comes from your past lives it comes from your higher mind it comes from your energy bodies it comes from the guardian angels and i can go on and on and on okay so for me i get answers from everywhere but i filter out those answers and i only follow the answers that come from god but you may not be able to do that immediately as to where i am that is a whole process and this is not the place to teach you all those things but currently any answer coming beyond your conscious mind explore them as to how they are serving you in the days to come and then you will know whether i should trust my answers or i should not trust my answers whenever i work with god i did not put god on a pedestal that what you say i am going to follow i followed the instructions but i did not follow uh the what i would say i did not believe in god i was talking with god working with god but i did not believe in god why i did not believe in god because i did not know he is god or not it took me 5 years to confirm that he is god not a small time 5 years day and night because i had to first find out who are not gods unless i know everything that is not god i will not come to know who is god so that was a different journey but for you you are still not aware of what is the non physical in the unseen world what is there which are talking to the humans but for the time being just say let the answer come from a place which serves me just say that and just be in that place of silence and let the answer emerge okay thank you thank you
asking that if someone betrays us how do we let go of that feeling of that pain of that trauma now you will be betrayed many a times in your life many humans will betray you between now and before you die how do you deal with it how do you deal with the pain how do you deal with the trauma normally no human knows how to deal with it at the most you will go to a counselor or therapist and you will just say i am feeling so bad i am feeling so down i am feeling i hate that person there is so much of anger in me i shouldn't have trusted that person i want to punish myself because i trusted that person this is all you will keep on saying and the therapist or the counselor will say yes i understand but let us forgive that person let us forgive yourself but i have a much better solution go and tell the same things to the book that person betrayed me and i am so angry on that person and i am so angry on myself i hate that person and i hate myself and you will notice and say i am not able to forgive that person and i am not able to forgive myself you will see the book will heal you and when you are totally healed you might even feel a little love for that person that will be the test okay thank you yes if you don't have a big voice you have to come front come <laughs> So now, living in the moment means I am not going to study. I am going for playing cricket because you told me. <laughs> Live in the moment. Okay. So what does this thing mean? Live in the moment. I say that living in the moment is being aware of what is happening to you. It is not about doing anything. Living in the moment is an awareness that right now I just want to play cricket. okay now there is something now i want to add one more line be committed to what you have decided to do you live in the moment but you are committed to what you have decided to do what does that mean that means that you know there is a test that is going to happen after 3 months and you know that you have to read you know you have to create uh, complete your assignments you know that you have to uh, prepare certain notes now these are the facts of life you cannot be in denial but at the same time you want to have fun and having fun for someone is playing cricket for someone it is coming together and having gossiping for some it is partying for some it is going to a restaurant for some it is going to the college canteen school canteen different people have different versions of what it means to have fun now how do you deal with it normal tendency would be leave aside the assignments and do what 
you feel like doing because that is how I am living in the moment. But living in the moment is not about that. You know what is that called as? That is called as escapism. And escapism is not living in the moment. You want to escape from the responsibility. What is your responsibility as a student? Your responsibility as a student is to learn what you came to learn. That is your responsibility as a student. You came to learn what you came to learn. And if that is your responsibility, your commitment is now to learn. You know how I make, how I operate in my life? I operate from a place of choice. What does choice mean? When I started working with God, everyone who was not who were not God came to me and they told me I will give you everything in life. Everything that you want, everything you can imagine. Can you imagine a person being told that you will be given everything that you want and everything beyond your imagination? I am that person. The highest of the highest came to me and said that. But I said, I have already committed to God that I will work for God. And my commitment is more important than the money that you will give me, than the success that you will give me, than the uh, all kind of powers, mystical powers that you will give me. Are you trying to make me a superman, godman? No. My commitment is more important to me. And I did not trade my commitment with what I was offered. And I knew God was not going to give me anything. God had made me very clear. I will, God said, God will not give you anything. You all want to work for me, you work. So I worked for nothing because I was committed. So you as a student decide why you came to this school. You did not come to this school to have fun. I am not saying not have fun. I am telling you how to really have fun. You can really have fun when you have already completed your assignments when you have already completed your learning. Because then you will go and have fun without any guilt. Most of you have fun with guilt. There is a difference. Behind your head something is saying I should have studied instead of being here and doing what I am doing. That will weaken you. You will become weak. Your strength is knowing what you have to do. And being in a school is like, I came here to learn what I came here to learn. And every class has a set of learning. I will explore them. I will look into them, go into them, contemplate on them. And I will also go and have fun without any guilt, without any kind of shame without any kind of feeling that I am doing the wrong thing in having fun. So I free you from that pressure, from that baggage. Try it for one month, you will see it's beautiful. Okay? Yes. When you, when you really want something, as soon as you get it, you eventually lose interest in it. Okay. Yeah. Why, why is it that when we want something and when we get it, when we eventually get it, why do we lose interest in it? 
that itself shows that you never wanted that thing. Oh. That shows that you wanted it because someone else had. That shows that you wanted it to prove something to others. And now I have proved it, I don't need it anymore, put it aside. That is why you lose interest. So, one, so, aliveness is what you will always have, where you will always treasure aliveness because it is spontaneous and ongoing. But in order to be alive, you really have to talk about your pain, about your guilt, about your suffering, about your misery to the book. And for one minute, two minutes, come out. Next day go and talk, come out. See the transformation happening in your life. One month I am telling you do it. You will be a totally different person. Okay? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Why do we have to be sentiments? That, that which has incidents to which really uh, disturbs the life of us. If we know that that, that is going to happen, if I'm closely associated with my ex, my dad, my parents, my wife, my son, we know that uh, it's sort of like reality in this life. But for certain days, after the death happened, we really in a, such a shocking mindset and then we don't come out of that. So you say that we are like, we are like, so at that particular time we go into some another world. So why don't, why don't we accept that? Why don't our mind accept that whatever has happened, that is just the acceptance of the God, accept it and we will and we are like. Why don't we? The, the question that I was asked is, why can't we accept death? I said that be alive. But how come we are not able to accept the death of a person who is very close to us, very dear to us, very near to us? Why do we become stuck in our sorrow, in our pain? Okay? The answer, now this is a little psychological answer, I do not know if you will get it, but I am just telling you. Everyone has an identity. Identity means, <clears throat> let's say if you are a mother and you are a wife and you are a sister and you are a daughter and you are a school teacher and you are a counsellor and you are also a cook. These are all identities. A totality of these identities is who you are. When something you lose, if someone loses their son, someone loses their spouse, someone loses their father, someone loses their uh, grandfather. Now why do we have so much pain? The pain is not because of the loss, but pain is because a part of you was broken and taken away with that person. A little difficult to understand, but just listen. You do not miss that person. You are missing that part of you which you lost. But forget about this uh, psychology. What you do? Go to the book. All the pain that I have because of losing that person. I am missing that person badly. I want my I want that person to come back in my life. I am not able to deal with whatever that person meant to me. Whatever thoughts you have, say to the book, come back. Next day again, go and say to the book, come back. And you will notice within a few days, you are at peace. Okay? Anyone else?
Ha. Everyone is satisfied with this evening? This morning. <laughs> Let me tell you something about God because there is there is no one who can ever tell you about God. <clears throat> I have not seen God. You want to you do you want to listen what I about God? Okay. I have not seen God, I have not, uh, I felt the presence of God, but I have not seen God. Now, God says that when I come across, I will come with your face, with your body. Which means, when others see me, they will see me as your face and as your body. Now, that was not what I wanted basically. I wish God had taken something else, but that is the way God decided it. But what was my experience with God? My experience with God is, He is a very simple individual. He is very ordinary. He is unlike the gods that you know. Have you seen the gods that you know? They are very magnificent. They are divine, they are holy, they mesmerize, they impress you. You are like, wow, you want to bow your head down to that God. I am not talking about those gods. True God, so simple, so ordinary, so beautiful, so soothing. And exactly at the same place where you are, not above you. That is my experience of God. And maybe someday you will experience God if God wills. But do not expect God to be extraordinary. Very ordinary. You will miss because you think God means someone who is dazzling. No dazzle. You think God will be someone like the film stars, so glamorous. No glamour. But very soothing. Very touching. You will feel calming down. You will feel you don't need anything in life when you are with God. You will have no desires. All your desires will fall away. All your wanting will fall away. But you are not going to become dead. You will come alive. And then you will have fun. Fun that you never had. A fun right now that I'm having with you all. I didn't come here really, I didn't know what to say. But I ended up saying so much. Okay? Thank you.